Good evening. Um, make sure when you see Charlie and Greg, you express to them how great they are in, in running the audio video for us. Because when they're not here, you got backup like me, and we've got another person backing up up there too. And so uh, running around here beforehand, I'm still trying to catch my breath uh, on that as well. But uh, before we begin tonight, I'd uh, like to have a short prayer. I'd like to mention a couple people. Uh, Sadana Magazoo requested prayers for a surgery she's having tomorrow at UAB. So remember her in your prayers. Uh, some of you have been around here long enough to remember Jim Marcel, a friend of mine that moved to, uh, to uh, South Georgia. And uh, he is in Gainesville, Florida at the VA hospital right now and not doing well. Uh, he's had uh, prostate cancer and some heart issues, and so uh, if you wouldn't mind remembering him in prayer as well, so, and as well as all the others that's on our list, and uh, there are several on there as well. So let's uh, go to God in prayer. Father, as we come to you in prayer this evening, we're thankful that we can approach you in prayer. We're thankful for the opportunity and the privilege of prayer. Father, we have a request this evening that you be with Sedona Magazoo in her upcoming surgery, with those that are giving care to her, also with Jim Marcel as he's having difficulties with his health. Father, we also pray for the others that are on our list, that are shut-ins, that are also having health issues that you would be with them and those that support them. Father, we ask that you would be with us this evening as we study your word, that we might fully comprehend how we can apply your word to our lives to live a better life and a more Christ-like life. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, how do you feel about people who have never had anything good to say. Have you ever been around people that every time you're around them, it's always bad, everything's bad, everything's negative? And as you're thinking, huh? <laughs> that's a good thing if you can. Sometimes, you know, you've got a person like that that's your supervisor or something, and it's hard to get away from them. You know, what about people that never have anything good to say about you? Have you ever had a person that it seemed like every time they were around you, they had something about you that they didn't like or they kind of ran down, maybe in a nice way, but they pretty much told you that they didn't like something about you? Maybe it was something minor like, you know, if you'd cut your hair, you'd look better. Or those shoes you've got on, they're, they're way out of style. You know, little things like that. Or they could be something more major, like your work setting. Why did they give you that promotion to section manager? You know, I would have been much better at that job. Now you say, well, what are we going in this direction for? Why would we be talking about how people treat other people? Well, tonight we're going to look at a, one of God's prophets and his message wasn't received very well. In fact, and we'll look at how long that was in a little bit, but he spent his entire career as a prophet, and nobody liked him. Uh, they always said bad things about him, treated him badly. And those receiving the message really just sort of ignored it and thought, we can't be touched. We'll talk about why in a little bit. You would think if God is speaking to you through a prophet, you'd want to pay attention. If God's speaking through a prophet, it's probably best not to shoot the messenger, but we're going to find in tonight's lesson and in many other lessons in this book that they tried very much to do just that. We're going to be talking about Jeremiah tonight in a a parable of his, but 
Jeremiah was often called by a lot of people the weeping prophet, the martyr prophet, even God's iron pillar. Some say and have characterized him as being the most persecuted character in the Old Testament. His countrymen cursed him, beat him, threw him into prison. You name it, he suffered it while trying to do God's will and telling them what he I was told to say. Uh, if you to look back at just a few verses as background, uh, we read in Jeremiah chapter 20. Now, Pasher, the son of Emmer, the priest who was also the chief governor in the house of the Lord, heard that Jeremiah prophesied these things. Then he struck Jeremiah the prophet and put him in the stocks that were in the high gate of Benjamin, which is the house of the Lord. And it happened on the next day that Pushimer brought Jeremiah out of the stocks, and then Jeremiah said to him, For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will make you a terror to yourself and to all your friends, and they shall fail by, fall by the sword of their enemies, and your eyes shall see it. I will give all Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall carry them captive to Babylon and slay them with the sword. Moreover, I will deliver all the wealth of this city, all its produce and all its precious things and all the treasures of the kings of Judah I will give into the hand of their enemies who will plunder them, seize them, and carry them to Babylon. And you, Pasher, and all that dwell in your house shall go into captivity. You shall go to Babylon, and there you shall die and be buried there, you and all your friends to whom you have prophesied lies. O Lord, you induced me and I was persuaded. You are stronger than I and have prevailed. I am derision daily. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I spoke, I cried out. I shouted, violence and plunder. Because the word of the Lord was made to me a reproach and a derision daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. Indeed, even though he was receiving such treatment, nobody believed him or took any actions on what he said. He said what God had told him, even though he said to himself, I just won't mention that anymore. He couldn't. He had to mention what God had told him. He had to do the work that he was picked to do. A couple other quick examples. Yeah, Jeremiah 32, 3 for Zedekiah king of Judah, had shut him up, saying, Why do you prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord? Behold, I will give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall take it. And Jeremiah 37, 15, Therefore the princes were angry with Jeremiah, and they struck him and put him in prison in the house of Jonathan the scribe, for they made that the prison. You know, Jeremiah, if you look at everything through that book, that he went through just trying to tell people what God had told him to say. He had a pretty rough life. And yet he carried on and spoke what God told him to speak. Remember how we started the lesson today. Jeremiah's task was to deliver bad news and his entire life was spent delivering bad news to people that didn't want to hear it. Now, a little more background tonight. We probably know a lot more about Jeremiah's life than many of the other major prophets. He was a priest before becoming a prophet. Growing up in the village of Anthroth, living in a rural area, he was familiar with agriculture and he used this in many of the, the teaching that he did. He told the leaders of Judah about the coming invasion of the Babylonian army and their coming captivity. The first three verses of Jeremiah mentions three kings whose reign, during whose reigns Jeremiah prophesied, and two others also ruled briefly. To look at a little, continue to looking a little bit of history and who some of these people were, uh, God called Jeremiah to be a prophet during the 18th year of the reign of Josiah. Now, this started off pretty well because he uh, 
five years after becoming king, he had a major reform movement that renewed the religion of the country. And Josiah supported Jeremiah in his ministry. Tragically, the reform was ended when, Jeremiah, when uh, Josiah was mortally wounded in 609 B.C. and subsequently died. He had three sons that succeeded him. Now, if you think about all the successions in the Old Testament between Israel and Judah and, and so forth, a lot of times the sons didn't work out quite as well as the father. Uh, the first one, Shalom, followed Josiah. He only reigned three months. Pharaoh Necho captured him and put him in chains and deported him to Egypt. Many expected that he'd be back. However, Jeremiah announced in chapter 22, verses 11 and 12, For thus saith the Lord concerning Shalom, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, who reigned instead of Josiah his father, who went from this place, he shall not return here any more. But he shall die in the place where they have led him captive, and he shall see this land no more. Now, Pharaoh then selected Jehoiakim to succeed Shalom. And after the defeat of Egypt by Babylon in 605 B.C., the king of Judah switched alliances, which you might say was fairly a smart move on his part, supposedly. However, Jeremiah, again, predicted that uh, things were bad and that, again, he would only reign three months before he was taken to Babylon. And Jeremiah again predicted that none of his descendants were successfully set on the throne of David. Zedekiah, the last king of Judah, also reigned for 11 years. And he, here Jeremiah consistently urged him to surrender to Babylon. So as we look back over Jeremiah's history, he, his ministry lasted for more than 40 years. So he spent more than 40 years telling the rulers things are bad and you're going to be taken captive and led off into captivity. His work included uh, that sort of preaching his whole life. The books that he was responsible for is Jeremiah and Lamentations. And... He also, through all this, had to face the fact that he was telling the people that it was pretty much hopeless, that he wasn't going to get results, but it was his job to go and tell them anyway. And, of course, we've already discussed they reacted badly to this. So as he remained faithful, even in the midst of all these obstacles, we need to think about things a little bit that we need to do the same. You know, doing God's will does not mean life will be smooth. You'd think Jeremiah is doing what God told him to do for over 40 years, and yet he was treated badly. He was beaten, put in prison. Uh, they said bad things about him all the time. He did not leave a, live a smooth life. But in spite of that, in spite of all these obstacles, he did exactly what God told him to do. I think that's one great lesson that we can learn from Jeremiah tonight. You know, uh, we're told in Revelation 2.10, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you in prison and you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. We want to look at a parable of his tonight. And for lack of a better name, and it fits it pretty well, the burying of a linen sash, or the linen sash. So if you want to, you can turn to Jeremiah chapter 13. And let's just read those first 10 verses, and then we'll dissect this some and talk about each part. Thus the Lord said to me, Go and get yourself a linen sash. You look, you've got the King James Version that will say girdle. And put it around your waist, but do not put it in the water. So I got a sash according to the word of the Lord and put it around my waist. And the word of the Lord came to me the second time saying, 
take the sash that you acquired, which is around your waist, and arise, go to the Euphrates, and hide it there in a hole in the rock. So I went and hid it by the Euphrates, as the Lord commanded me. Now it came to pass after many days that the Lord said to me, Arise and go to the Euphrates, and take from there the sash which I commanded you to hide there. Then I went to the Euphrates and dug, and I took the sash from the place where I had hidden it. And there was the sash, ruined. It was profitable for nothing. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Thus saith the Lord, in this manner I will ruin the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. This evil people who refuse to hear my words, who follow the dictates of their hearts and walk after other gods to serve them and worship them, shall be just like this sash, which is profitable for nothing. For the sash clings to the waist of a man, so I have caused the whole house of Israel and the house of Judah to cling to me, says the Lord, that I may become my people, that they may become my people for renown, for praise, and for glory, but they would not hear. As we start looking at the first couple verses, uh, this parable is actually, if you go through the rest of Jeremiah, this is the first of five related lessons found in Jeremiah. And as usual with a parable, a lesson is tied to something very basic and very simple. In this case, it was a linen sash. Now, the fact that God told him to get one may mean he didn't have one or he didn't usually wear such a garment. Uh, but the sash was, or a girdle, if you uh, go by the King James Version, was a short skirt wrap around the waist, can be served as an undergarment, if you will. And it was worn here next to the skin. Now, look, did, uh, look in a little research, different people have ideas on why God selected and asked him to get a linen sash and uh, why he was to put it uh, around his waist. Uh, one commentator said, why linen? This was a mark of the priesthood, if you remember back. And, uh, and because this garment was given as a representation of Israel, it had to be linen in order to properly symbolize the nation of priests unto God, which Israel was intended to be. Indeed, it does uh, symbolize a uh, representative of Israel. And said, put it around his waist uh, as it was worn next to the skin, a very intimate and personal a personal garment, if you will, symbolized the intimate relationship between God and Israel during the long centuries of the nation's development. God, of course, intended this to be an intimate and personal relationship. He intended it to be a nation that served him and gave him praise and glory, but they kept deviating from that. Now, you noticed in those first couple verses, he was not to put it into water. Uh, it seems that the linen was usually put in water to make it a softer garment. This meant that Jeremiah's sash here would remain rough and stiff, which further added to his discomfort. You know, a lot of God's prophets did not live a comfortable life. Even going to the New Testament, John the Baptist, uh, we read in Matthew 3, 4, now John himself was clothed in camel hair with a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. Indeed, uh, many had to uh, endure things that were difficult. Now, he did exactly what God had told him to do. And as you mentioned, we mentioned a while ago, uh, Jeremiah even at times said that, you know, I will not say anymore, but he couldn't hold back. You know, as we think about things that we go through today and that we think about how we speak things, how we talk about things. You know, persecution is, is real. It's becoming more prominent when Christians speak the truth. Uh, when we speak the truth in a church service, instead of what men on the outside want to hear, uh, you get feedback that's not pleasant sometimes. But just like Jeremiah, 
we're, ch we're challenged to always preach the exact word of God, not what people want to hear. Uh, there are churches around us, and there are even churches that have Church of Christ on their label that sort of deviate a little bit and, and change things to the extent that people are happier with it because it's good things. Like Jeremiah, they wanted him to speak good things and good prophecies to him. Don't teach us all this stuff or tell us all things are going to happen that are bad for us. Teach us good things. And so many churches today, that's exactly what they do. They teach good things. They teach about God's love, but they don't teach about the other things that God has said. So we need to be like Jeremiah and never hold back on a single word from the Word of God, from the Bible, the literal Word of God. Now in the parable, as he goes on in verses 3 through 7, and there's a time period here, and we don't know exactly what that time period was. It just says many days. It could be, uh, and we're going to look a little bit about the situation here and people's different ideas about how long this journey was. Uh, he was to take the sash to the Euphrates. Now, it seems that the, if it was from his hometown of Anthroth, and the Euphrates meant the Euphrates River, that's a distance of about 400 miles, which would have meant Jeremiah had to go 400 miles, 400 miles back, later 400 miles, and 400 miles back. Now, as you can imagine, uh, many of the scholars uh, take a look at this and say, well, maybe it meant this, maybe it meant that. Give you a little bit of background here. Uh, some say that what was being talked about was a village about three miles north of Anthroth, which had a very similar name and which was also referred to as Euphrates at times. And this would have been somewhere close, where it would have been easy for Jeremiah to go back and forth. However, you know, it's not our place to try to make Jeremiah's job easy or to interpret it so to make it easy, but to do our best to determine uh, what was really meant. All we know for sure is that Jeremiah did exactly what he was told to do. He went to Euphrates, whether it was Euphrates the river or Euphrates the village or another possibility. Uh, one statement of a commentator said, this statement has participated, precipitated a whole barrage of quibbles and denials by commentators. And... Uh, there is no problem with what's said. It makes no difference in the meaning of the parable. But just some, uh, a couple things in background. One is, is that, of course, he went to the Euphrates River and he made two trips of that distance, which was possible. Uh, and uh, some interpret it that way. When they get down and looking at the words used, the word for Euphrates here, other places in the Old Testament was used also accompanying another word rivet, with it that certainly meant Euphrates the river. Uh, three of the four times in this text, that other phrase was not with it. Doesn't mean it wasn't Euphrates the river. Another possibility, uh, Jeremiah appears to have been absent from Jerusalem during a major part of Jehoiakim's brief three-year reign. And he may very well have been supposed uh, to have been during that time near the city of Babylon. So he would have been near the Euphrates River. So we don't know, we're not told where Jeremiah was actually at when he started his journey. And all we know is that he went to the Euphrates. Well, that's all we actually need to know. God always gives us what we need to know. And the important thing is, is that Jeremiah went to the Euphrates as he understood it and did exactly what God told him to do. And how and when and how far he went and so forth is no uh, reflection on what was intended here for the meaning of this parable. You know, as always, we gin up questions and we'd like to know more details about what God's provided in his word. Sometimes we say, well, why didn't 
we get this and this and this about many subjects. But we can always be assured that we have what we need. We don't need any more or God would have given us the additional information. So never let the unknown details distract from the message and the lesson provided. And we can get wrapped up in these things that the various scholars get into and miss the whole point of what we're being told. Now Jeremiah was directed to hide this sash in a hole or cleft in a rock by the Euphrates. And then he went away for a time and came back. Now, a linen sash, those of you that know about clothing and stuff, you leave it for a period of time stuck in essentially the ground or in a rock, and if it was by the river where water might slash up on it for a period of time, what would you expect when he went back to get it? Indeed, he found the sash was ruined and useless. And a sash is either useful or useless. In the same way, one is either a sinner or a Christian or in Christ. Can't be either or either one. You got to be one or the other. Either we belong to God or we don't. And those outside of Christ should seek no other relationship but to be one with Him, one with Christ. Matthew twelve thirty, He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Now the value of the sash, if you will, is determined by the way it fulfills its original purpose. Once he got it up and the sash was ruined, it was no longer fit to be used as a sash or a girdle, if you go by the language in the King James, but it was useless. And we need to make sure that, that we think about that as well. Remember back to the... Uh, parable of the talents, uh, tw Matthew 25, 28. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents, for to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even that that he has will be taken away. You know, if we don't use what we have, then it may be lost. Uh, if we're given an ability to do something for God and we don't use it, we may lose that ability. We need to take advantage of, of what abilities we have. Now, as we look on down at verses 8 through 11, we're not really left in doubt about the meaning of this parable because Jeremiah says, Thus saith the Lord. So he's given a direct interpretation from God and just as the linen sash was ruined by the exposure to water and the passing of time the Lord promised to ruin the pride of Judah being God's people the people of Judah had boasted of this relationship and of their particular law and of enjoying God's favor now we're going to look at a few more but essentially what's being said there is the people had enjoyed God's favor through the years. And they'd essentially got to the point that they thought, God's going to take care of us no matter what we do. And some people think the same thing today. So they say, well, it doesn't really matter exactly how we worship or what we do all the time. But, you know, as long as we say we believe in God and we go to church once in a while, we'll be okay. They were sort of saying the same thing. We'll look a little more at that here as we go on. And those in Jerusalem even had a greater pride, if you will. They thought that we live in the city of David and the location of the temple. Now God dwells with the temple, and they boasted that Jerusalem would never fall because of the destruction of the holy temple they considered to be an unthinkable occurrence. We have the temple. This is the city of David. We have nothing to worry about. God would not destroy this. Jeremiah 7, 4 says, Do not trust these lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. 
and kind of looking at uh, some uh, other works, if you will, and some, some comments that some people have made regarding this statement. Pretty much just what we said, the people thought that they were protected, if you will, regardless of what they did. Um, the uh, one commentator said they, the people appeared to use this as kind of these words as kind of a charm uh, to protect and bless them, even in the pursuit of their wicked ways. Uh, Matthew Henry said it was the can of the times, it was their mouths upon all occasions. If they had received bad news, they load themselves to sleep again, saying, We cannot but do well. We have the temple of the Lord among us. Again, you, you look and they, in thinking that what they had gave them essentially the permission to do whatever they thought was right. Uh, and by doing so, they sort of put themselves as gods. They said, we, whatever we think has got to be as right as what God thinks. Now, as a comparison today, could we be guilty of the same thing at times? If you look throughout the religious world, I think that's definitely the case. But what if you went around and said, you know, I've been baptized into Christ. We're in Christ, have nothing to fear no matter what we do in life. We are safe. And you see by actions of some and some religious bodies, that's essentially what they say. We can deviate. We can do something different. We don't have to do exactly what the Bible says. And because, you know, we're in Christ. And though many of those are not. So as we think about that, we need to be careful that we don't put what we think ahead of what God thinks. And that we don't try to think that just because we go to church that we indeed can sort of do what we want. It all boiled down to pretty much pride, isn't it? And we all know where pride falls. Pride is something that gets everyone in trouble. You get to the point where you think you're so good, you do things so well that you're fine no matter what. You ignore some of the little details, if you will. You know, Paul addressed this same kind of problem uh, in Romans chapter 2. I want to read a few verses there. Indeed, you are called a Jew and, the rest, and rest on the law and make boast in your God and know his will and approve the things that are excellent being instructed out of the law. And are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind and a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. Yet, therefore, who teach another? Do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob the temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blaspheming among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. Pretty much the, the same thing. Those that Jews that, uh, that were being addressed here, saying, you know, you rely. You know, you say you've got your heritage, your descendants of Abraham, You've got the law, and yet when you look at what you're doing, in many cases, you're committing the things that are against the law. So as we think about God's uh, rebuke here, it's sort of clear, and we can apply it to ourselves today, but those who live and act like they did in the time of Jeremiah will become like the rotten sash, good for nothing. You know, the sins of the people were, if you will, magnified because they were sins against privilege. God had caused the house of Israel to cling to him, Psalms 148, 14, 
And he exalted the horn of his people, the praise of all his saints, of the children of Israel, a people near to him. Praise the Lord. He had wanted them to be a nation that would praise and glorify him and follow his law. But he didn't get that. Uh, they were counted for nothing without a corresponding obedience and devotion. You know, it's one thing to say, I love God. I want to follow everything that, that Christ has told us to do. And yet, do none of that but say words. And in essence, they were relying on the fact that they were descendants of Abraham. And they had the law, but they didn't do most of what the law said for them to do. They deviated from what they were relying upon. And they definitely didn't do things to praise and glorify God that had created them and taken Israel as, as his nation to do that. So as they did not demonstrate their grace and power, they ended up in the same boat, just like the sash that was done, that was good for nothing. Uh, we don't want to lull ourselves into actions where we think without doing anything, without truly being obedient and devoted to Christ and God, devoted to his church, that we can just say a few words and, and everything is fine and then we can go about doing things the way we want to do them. You know, as we look at things around us today, uh, there's not a whole lot different. We have so many people that say the words but then fail to actually follow what God says to do, just like many of them at that time said the words, but they didn't really follow the law. Like uh, Paul said there, it, you know, you say do not steal, and yet do you steal? Uh, it's one thing to say one thing and then do the complete opposite. If we look at a few other New Testament passages about the actions that were to bring glory to God. Philippians 2.15, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Indeed, we should shine as lights. One that as people look at us and our actions and compare that to what the Bible says, we should match up. We shouldn't be found lacking. We should be lights to shine to others and guide them in the way. 1 Peter 2.9, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We need to praise God and to worship him. That's why we gather on the first day of the week in accordance with the commands in the New Testament. We do that to bring glory to God and to worship him and praise him. Titus 2.14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, jealous for good works. You know, he redeemed us from every lawless deed, but we're to make sure that we remain pure and remain that we are the type that seeks good works. You know, it's really sad, God's conclusion in the matter here through Jeremiah. The final words he said was, they would not hear. They were told they could have changed their ways they wouldn't hear. You know, Romans 10, 17 says, so then by faith comes hearing and hearing by the word of God. If we don't hear, 
we can't learn the truth. James 1.22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. Just like them in Jeremiah's time, uh, if we just hear what we don't do, we haven't accomplished anything. But they were given the chance. Even Jesus speaking in Matthew 23, 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are, are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. Jesus asked, and he was here to, to uh, deliver the message and to make the sacrifice for us. And how many actually were willing? And after he left this earth and the apostles went out and taught, they converted many, but how many still refused to hear? You know, in, in looking at Jeremiah's time, the people of Judah and Jerusalem, even in the passage we read tonight, they sort of stretched God beyond his patience. Babylonians did capture Jerusalem. They broke down the wall and destroyed the temple, that temple that they thought nobody would ever destroy. And most of the inhabitants were taken into captivity, and only a remnant would uh, come back 70 years later. Despite Jeremiah's ministry, prophetic warnings that he gave, the people became as useless as, to God as that rotten sash that he went back to retrieve. You know, if we don't, because, if we don't believe God and do and obey what God has given us, we too can become useless, just like that sash that was dug out of the ground. Some couple of practical obs observations, if you will. You know, it seems impossible for people to be so disobedient as those were in Jeremiah's time, yet they did not have the privilege that we do today living under a new covenant, a better covenant. And yet, people today still do the same thing. The Lord's still seeking people that will come and obey and give praise to his name. And we need to make sure we don't become worthless uh, to him today. You know, we, if we fall, we have to repent, keep on, not letting setbacks cause us to give up. You know, one thing I really stuck with me is Ricky in his Sunday morning Bible classes on the apostles has made a point many times as the apostles were everyday people. They were just men that became devoted to him and they followed him, but they made mistakes. But when they did, they got back up, and they kept going, and they got better. We probably don't know all the mistakes they made. We know what has been told us in the Bible. But no matter what happened, they kept back up and kept going. So as we think about that, no matter what happens in our life, we need to make sure that we come back, if we sin, if we fall, repent, and get back up and keep going. Revelations 2.10, do not fear any of the things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, that you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. You know, we're given the task of being faithful after we become a Christian, being faithful unto death. And this requires us, no matter what we faced, to keep going to get up if life knocks us down and to keep trying to do God's will. You know, God knows all that's in our heart, our innermost thoughts, and we are to keep trying to work towards being the Christians he wants us to be. Let's make sure that we don't become useless like the linen sash that Jeremiah went and buried and went back and retrieved. Thank you for your attention this evening. And I believe that was the bell. Next week we will continue.
with another Old Testament parable yet to be selected.